The world of work has changed and we have to change how we think about the world of work. How do we both have a full on career and life while we're both parenting four children? How much careers advice do you get in school? Like pretty much none. And we're saying that we have a skills shortage and we have a talent shortage. We're just looking in the wrong places. So it's about progression, it's about linearity, it's about the objective measures of success in our career. So it's about title, it's about pay, and it's about responsibility and roles. And they're all important things. I'm not saying they're not, but our careers are no longer linear. Your career is evolving all of the time. This is the time when you need this job. And I was like, but it's making me so sad. I'm so sad on this job. We very often just didn't even think about changing because you did that job, you trained for it, you invested in it and you stayed in it. But the options for changing weren't really there. And if you want to evolve in your career, to have a curvy career, something that takes a shot in a different direction, do it. Series 8 of the Dig podcast. I can't believe it, guys. We are almost at 100 episodes, over a quarter of a million downloads. And the growth of the podcast has been amazing. But I just have one thing I'm asking of you guys today. If you love listening to the Dig podcast and you love all the new guests each week, then I'm asking if you could hit subscribe or follow. So if you listen on Apple or Spotify, if you could hit follow. And if you watch on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. It means the podcast reaches more people. When I reach out, people actually actually have heard of the Dig Podcast, they know about it and they're more willing to be a guest. And then I'm able to bring even more actionable advice to you guys. So it's really, really, um, it's it really helps the podcast grow. So I'm asking for your help on that, on that point today. And I just can't wait to dive into the series. I love on the Dig Podcast when we have returning guests because there's a big sign there. It means you guys absolutely love them. And this guest that I have on today, Sinead Brady, you loved her, like one of the most listened to podcasts that I have ever done. And there's a reason. And the start of the content that I had with um, Sinead the last time was, why are we working so hard, Sinead? And we do, we all work hard. Everybody who listens to Dig Podcast are hard workers. We all want to do better in our roles, in our jobs, in our self-employed roles. Um, and Sinead is a career psychologist. Now you're going to, if you haven't listened to her first podcast, I'm going to link it in the show notes so you can catch up with everything that we've previously talked about because it's so, so relevant and kind of evergreen, like it never dates the things we were talking about. But um, Sinead is a mum and she's a wife and she's building a house too. She's telling me all the drama there. And she is a lifelong learner. She had written in her bio and a deep thinker, just like all of us. We're all trying to like figure this out. It's so hard. Um, yeah, she, Sinead like speaks all over, like she's global speakers. You see her on TV and Ireland AM and all over the world really and helping businesses and companies and, and individuals and um, figure this out, this career, this, you know, the psychology behind it, how we're feeling about where we're at in the world of work. Um, and she's back and we're going to talk today um, about career change. So when I'm mentoring people or talking to businesses, nobody's really supposed to stay. Well, maybe they are. We'll talk to Janine about that. But are we really built to stay in the same job all our lives or the same role? I don't know. I don't, I'm not convinced. I'm certainly not, as you can see from my very um, colourful career path. But, you know, it's very hard to get over the psychology of taking the step, I think, um, taking the leap the courage and all of that. So Sinead is here to talk about it. Thank you so much. Sinead. You're so welcome, Caroline. What a gorgeous introduction. <laughs> Just comes flowing out of me, right? It does, yeah. But no, but I mean it. I mean it because um, actually, I have like I love all the guests, but I always say I was talking to this girl, Shanae yeah. Brady. Now I bring the example, and we're going to link it in the show yeah. notes. Our previous conversation because we're mums and we're juggling. Yeah. You know, it was homework. So you yeah. Said to me, I don't know if you remember, yeah. but you um, said to me actually, I, I'm more into making sure my child's happy and safe and healthy, and if they're crying at the kitchen table and it's a lovely evening outside, I take that decision to close their books and, and make them be free of that. That freed me up a lot um, from the uh, guilt as a yeah. parent for what goes on at the kitchen table because we all go through it. Yes. Um, and you said loads of things in that podcast and as I said, I'll, we'll link it. But thanks for being here in the Dillon Hotel. I know so welcome. we were able to squeeze in that one last one today and I, I was like, oh my God, I'd love to ask Sinead but it's such late notice but you said yes so thank you so much for being here. Um, we're going to talk about career change. That's Talk to me about career change. What is career change? What does that mean? 
So it means so many different things. But the first thing I'd say to people, we kind of almost have to shift the narrative around the language that we're using because an awful lot of the language that we use around careers is linked to ladders. So it's about progression. It's about linearity. It's about the objective measures of success in our career. So it's about title, it's about pay and it's about responsibility and roles. And they're all important things. I'm not saying they're not, but our careers are no longer linear. I say they're curvy careers. They're like they take all these twists and turns and they no longer go in a straight line. So we need to lose that kind of language around ladders and begin to think more in terms of curves and change and development. Now, there's loads of different statistics out there around how often we change job and change careers across our lifetime. And I'm not really sure that they're overly helpful because sometimes it makes people think, well, I should be or I must or, I, you know, But what I would really say to people is your career is evolving all of the time. And to come back to what you said at the very beginning, you know, should we be staying in the one job? So when we had these one job, uh, one job for life um, and it was linear and was in one organisation typically and in the one industry, definitely. um, We very often just didn't even think about changing because you did that job, you trained for it, you invested in it and you stayed in it. But the options for changing weren't really there. So if you imagine, we now have 12,000 job families with unique jobs within those. So we have this diverse range of options and opportunity that we didn't have. So I graduated from college, you know, um, from secondary school in 1998. And the jobs that are in front of me now were not even a thought in anybody's head at the time. So to think that we would need to stay in that one role for the rest of our lives or that one career for the rest of our lives is putting us into little boxes and then not giving us the option to think about other opportunities. So let's think about curves in our career, changes and about how we change as individuals. I'm a very different person than I am now than I was when I was 17, but the majority of us are. And what's really interesting from a psychology perspective, Caroline, is that we now know that we actually don't mature. Our brain doesn't mature to full adulthood till we're about 25. So making an adult choice at 17 or 18 is when many of us do, um, is actually at a time in our life when we're not in a position to make long term decisions based on who we actually are. So we're only getting to know ourselves, we're only growing up. Um, and when you think about it, I mean, you've got kids, I've got kids, many listeners have kids. You look at them at 17, you go, God, I hope they don't make any big decisions. And for the most part, they don't even know what they want for their dinner, <laughs> let alone what they're going to want to do in 10 or 15 years time. So at about 23 to 25, depending on the person, we get to kind of cognitive maturity. So that's when we're actually able to make these really rational decisions. So really making very definitive decisions about the box you're going to sit in for the next 40 years and possibly longer. You know, we have to question the logic of that. And then if making the decision to stay in it and then deciding to do nothing else and not change, you know, if that's not making you happy, think about your career as evolving. And... Like there's people listening and they've been in the job for 30 years and have the itch and the desire and the urge and the skills and everything that can make it great, but they just don't have the courage. Absolutely. And I love that you're using the word courage because so often we talk about confidence and I think confidence is so overrated. We know, we all know people who are overly confident and they tell you what they could and would do. And at the end of it all, it can be smoke and mirrors. But courage is a whole different thing. Courage is very definitely thought out. It's very much about saying, this is what I can do. This is how I can do it. These are where my gaps are. And this is what I'm going to do to fill that gap if I need to in order to make a change. So courage is, I would say to people, if you're thinking about evolving in your career and you're going to have a curvy career, you want to change. Begin to learn to understand the story of your career to now. So if you're that person who's 10, 15, 20, even five years in your current role, in your current industry, and you're going, I would love something different. I want something different. In fact, I need something different. I feel like I'm burning out in this industry or I'm rusting out. And this is something that not many people talk about. So burnout is where you're overwhelmed, overstretched, overworked. Rust out is where you're in a role and you could do it with your eyes closed. You're bored. But the output, the, 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 the symptoms are the same. You begin to be restless. You begin to feel discontent. You're frustrated. You're angry with everybody around you. You're doing your job. You could do it with your eyes closed. You're ultimately bored. So you could be rusting out or you could be burnt out. I've never heard of that before now. Rusting out. Rusting out. So does does rusting out mean you're not happy in your job? The same as, but burnout doesn't really mean that. Is that right? Burnout means maybe there's something not right and you're burnt out, but you still love your job. Am I right? So you could love your job 
and be rust still be rusted out as okay. such, <laughs> but you just may not be challenged. Okay. So the demands of your job are not stretching you enough. You've got so many resources, so much ability, and you're just kind of stuck. So it could be either way. But in any case, whatever the situation is, begin to ask yourself, what's the story of my career? Where did I start? And where am I now? And literally, with colours on an A3 sheet, get down on the floor and whatever year you started, the first paid job you had, map the whole way through to where you are now. And in a rough timeline, begin to put in the different jobs that you've had, the different kind of opportunities that you've had, and really begin to understand the story of your career. What has got you to here? And what skills have you built along the way? So say, for example, your first job was in the local post office or the local shop or mowing lawns. Like, what was the motivation for that job? Was it a bit of pocket money? Was it because you actually liked mowing lawns? Or was it because you really enjoyed the social interaction? And then keep going through the whole way to where you are now and ask yourself, well, what's the day-to-day function of my role? Do I enjoy that? Does it map to the things that I like and the skills that I have? And really begin to understand the story of your career. And there's something fabulous in doing that because you begin to see, well, actually, I really achieved this and I really did that and I'm really interested in this. And then you begin to say, well, actually, where I am now just isn't right for this season of my life. It's not the right space for me or the right place for me during this season of my life. And even if you are that person that has been in that job for 30 years or five years or 10 years, you've already committed to change. You've already been used to change. So change is not as big a step as you think it might be. You've actually already evolved in your career. There's no way that you still have the same skills in the same form as you had them at the beginning of your career. You've definitely upskilled, you've definitely reskilled, you've definitely increased the technical ability in your role. You have experience, you have knowledge, and you've built all these human skills. I refuse to call them soft skills. You've built all these human skills, communication, negotiation, um, the ability to talk to people, mentor people. You know, there's all these fabulous problem solving skills and you've got all this knowledge from your industry over the years. So you are replete with so much knowledge, so much ability. And if you want to evolve in your career, to have a curvy career, something that takes a shot in a different direction, do it. You said, um, just to jump in, but when we were talking before that, and you actually made me believe it too, I think, well, it's obviously, uh, if there's something in it, but that anybody can do anything because you can learn the technical side of anything. Absolutely. And then it's all the skills on top of that are a bonus. So it's about, you can, You have to believe that you can do it and then learn the technical side if you can't do that, but bring all your skills to the fore. So absolutely. So here's the thing. All jobs have two different types of skills within them. We're all careers or all functions, whatever it is, whatever way, whatever you want to call it. So the technical skills that are necessary to perform the function of the role. So everybody that's doing a particular role, an accountant, a doctor, a nurse, a teacher, there are technical skills that you can learn. And that's to help you to carry out the function of your role. And over the years, you become more skilled at them and and so on. But then there's the the human skills that are necessary to be able to carry out the technical skills. And they're the bits that kind of move you on in your career. We know that at about age 23 to 25, you can learn pretty much anything that you set your mind to. We've been taught that you can't. We've been taught that you're either good at maths or you're good at English or you're good at these different things. You're right-brained or left-brained. That has all been disproved. There is no such thing really as right or left brained. Um, it's fascinating the information that we have on all of that right now. Um, and actually, if you're good at music, you're operating the same skill set as that for maths. So it's really interesting. And often we think, well, if you're good at, like, you know, if I'm good at music, I mightn't be good at maths because I'm creative, but I'm not mathematical. So when you get to 23, these, these are my notes. Um, I not that you need them. You haven't looked down once. <laughs> They're really important though because okay. the writing helps me. Yes, okay. Crystallise. So what I would say is as you begin to think about your career and maybe evolving in your career, you can learn any technical skill that you want. So say you're a nurse and you want to become a coder. You can do that. But you just have to be, to give yourself permission to say, I can do hard things. I can learn new things. And I've proven that over the past 30 years. So here I am now, I'm starting new. This is going to feel hard, absolutely. And your brain is going to fight with you. But that's just like any other muscle in your body, a sign that your brain is growing, that you're using a new part of it that you haven't used before. So if you can imagine your brain as a muscle like any other part of your body, and if you haven't walked in six months and you got up and started to walk, you'll be stiff the next day, you'll be sore. You go, why did I do that? And then you get up and you go again. 
It's exactly the same with learning a new skill, technical skill that you haven't learned before. So don't worry about that. Yes, it will be hard. Yes, it will require effort. Yes, there's probably going to be professional skills that are required. So there's rules around certain roles. To be a practicing nurse, you have to have, you know, your your accreditation. To be, there's, you know, all the different accreditation bodies that make sure that you have the technical skills. But all of the other stuff, you bring that with you. So you're not starting from scratch. You are evolving in your career. Okay, right. This is good stuff. So whenever, um, I suppose what, that's all around giving yourself the courage then, right? right? So we're building up our courage. We're doing the timeline. We're seeing all the colours and seeing that we actually are very skilled people yes. and we can do anything. Now we have another barrier. Now, I don't know if this is right. This is just in my head. And when I hear people saying, what are people going to say to me? about leaving my good job. So I don't know if I told you this in the last podcast, but that I was an occupational therapist. Did I tell you this? We yeah. talked about it actually afterwards. After. It's very interesting, yeah. And um, mummy kills me for telling this because now she's like, I didn't say that, but she did. Um, so I was 20, I just graduated, worked two years and I always wanted to own business and be in retail or whatever. And I was leaving my occupational therapy. Well, you would have thought there was a death in the family. Yeah. She was, she was like begging me, don't, don't be doing that now, Caroline. Good job yeah. now. And you worked so hard and you gra- you're the only yeah. one in the house to graduate. And yeah. I didn't love that picture on the wall. I was like, oh, mommy, I love to. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is I had the courage because I was younger to just say, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. Yeah. When people meet this hurdle later on yeah. in life, which is what I hear people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, yeah. 60s. Yeah. They're not fit to fight that um, a opinion of yeah. others. Yeah. Have you any tips for people listening who have, have the courage, they're ready to go, but that holds them back what what people are saying and pe- what people are thinking? Absolutely. And I talk about this from a personal perspective because the same happened to me. And when I was in that early stage of my career, I was one of those people that left school at 17. I was very young, moved to Dublin, did an undergrad, went to the King's Inns to train as a barrister. My gr- Both grannies thought this was the business. I decided I didn't want to be a barrister and that was a shock, but I, w- I had to finish it out. My parents were like, you must finish it out. So I finished it out and then I decided that I wanted to go into careers and I did a master's in career guidance um, in Trinity and I was one of the first two people in Ireland to qualify um, that wasn't a teaching a teacher beforehand. So I never trained as a teacher, but I qualified as a guidance counsellor to operate within the secondary school system. And then I did my psychology qualification and then I did my coaching psychology and subsequently the occupational psychology. So I have been that person. And in the early years, it wasn't as hard as you say. But when I got a bit older, you know, the joke was, what's Sinead going to be when she grows up? And it was 40 was the answer my family book came. <laughs> and I'm now beyond that. <laughs> and I'm still not there. So what I would say to people is set your non-negotiables. What is important to you during this season of your life? And be very careful around your financial stability because as you grow into different seasons of life, financial security becomes different. So when you're a bit younger, it might be just yourself or you might have no other responsibilities, caregiving or otherwise. But as you get older, there's different responsibilities and they're different for everybody. But you'll still have to pay rent, pay a mortgage, you know, maybe health insurance, whatever it is that you need to cover for you and the people in your life that you love. And understand what your financial non-negotiables are. Understand what it is that you need to cover if you're six months not working or a year not working or whatever that looks like. And don't shriek away from that because that's so easy to step away from. Understand what you need to cover the bills and then understand what you need to have for the little extra luxury and then what you have and it was all going really, really well. And then make your decision about your career. But be rational about your decision making process. So be really comfortable in that decision making process yourself. Understand your career to date. That's through your career story. And then make a decision about what your next step is during this season of your life. And you don't have to discuss that with everybody before you make the decision. So everyone has a support circle of some type and you will have different people in your support circle for different reasons. And I like with your mum, my mum was like, I left a permanent pensionable job six weeks after having our first baby. And um, I just couldn't go back. I'd promised her when I when she was born the day afterwards and she's nearly 12 now. But the day after I was sitting in the bed with her, I'd had a section 
and I couldn't move. I didn't know what was after. I was just all over the place. And I was like, I was so afraid of breaking her. You know, when I break her physically, psychologically, I was like, what am I going to do with this little person that completely depends on me? And I promised her, I said, Sai, I promise you that I will be a role model. I'll teach you right from wrong and that I will always be here for you no matter what. And I made that promise to each of my four kids the morning after they were born. And a couple of weeks after she was born, I was brought back to the permanent pensionable job in a, in a meeting and I was going to have to do something that I wasn't qualified for that was totally different from the job I left. And I said, I can't. I made that promise to Sive. And if I break that promise now, I'm done as a mother. So I left. And there was a long story to that, but I left. And I didn't tell everybody immediately, but my own mother was like, this is the time when you need this job because you have your summers off, you have your evenings off, you know, and it's permanent and it's pensionable. And I was like, I know, but it's making me so sad. I'm so sad on this job and I won't be a good mother. I can't be a good mother when I'm in this job. And um, I left and it was the hardest decision because I loved the function of what I was doing. And um, so it's not easy making that decision. And there are influential people who will say things to you that you don't want them to say. You want them to say you're doing the right thing for you. That's the right thing for you. But maybe they're not the person in your support circle that you need to turn to for that advice. Maybe you need to turn to that person and say, will you give me a hug? That's the support that you need from that person. And actually, the career advice or the advice about the next season of your life is from somebody in your support circle, maybe somebody you pay. So it might be that you need to go to external and get external advice or somebody in your support circle who you know will be honest, will be non-judgmental and won't be afraid of saying, you know what, you're making the right decision, but be really rational in this decision. So think it out, be strategic, be clear about your next step, understand your finances, understanding what you're going to do next, why you're going to do it and how you're going to do it. It may not be the perfect plan. You may have to curve in it. That's why they're curvy careers. But understand that not the person that you want that support from in your support circle may not always be the person to give you that. So maybe just to protect yourself, you step back, you make your decision around your non-negotiables. This is what I need from my career. This is why I need it. This is how I'm going to do it. And this is what I'm going to do. And then you have the discussion with that person. And if they say, well, what about your finances? What about your pension? You have the answer to those questions. So you're able to say, well, my pension will still be there. Um, Financially, I'm actually secure for two years. So I have the option to do this or I'm secure for six months or whatever. Or we've actually thought about this. And I'm going to take a role that I'm not emotionally attached to, but covers all the general expenses so that I can go down this route. So you have the answers to those questions that you know that person who loves you and cares about you is going to ask. But you're able to manage it because you've emotionally developed the answers to those questions. And that takes work. It's not easy. So anybody that says they've changed career overnight or done something quick, were either lucky in the choice that they made or telling absolute complete lies um, because it's not possible to change path or career overnight. And I would say to anybody that's kind of looking at this and going, OK, so I'm going to do a personality test. Or I'm going to do a careers test or, and that will tell me what I should be. Please don't pay a lot of money for something like that because they are a piece of the puzzle. They're not the entirety of it. And some of them are about as reliable as a horoscope. Now, that's not saying that people who believe in horoscopes, you know, I don't mean, but they are not from an academic perspective. They're not reliable. They're not valid. You can't repeat them. So you need to be really careful. And there are some um, opportunities, let's call it. I'm saying that with a hesitancy, where you would be asked for huge amounts of money to do a battery of these tests. Oh, I didn't know this. I didn't know those that about those tests. Yes. Okay. And, you know, there's an opportunity and it's it's like six weeks and this would be, you know, that that isn't that is just not the right way to go about it. If they form part of an overall process that is months long, that's different. But if it's like a quick fix, you have to ask yourself, what is the value and integrity of this? Because I'm investing for the next five, 10 or 15 years of my life. Mm-hmm. So really cling to the idea of being rational. Think about it. Self-reflect. Understand why. Understand how. Understand what next. 
but don't end up rationalising a decision for 20 years and going, well, I've made this decision, it was a quick one and now I have to kind of step into it and just get on with it, be gritty about this, even though I know it's not the right decision. That's rationalising. Been rational is going, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. Now this is why I'm doing this. And it mightn't be 100% perfect in the curvy career, but at least you know you did your best to understand what next. But don't rationalise a bad decision for 20 years. Recently, I've been doing some research on different like conditions, family, like things that are going on in different fam- health conditions online. And, you know, it's very hard sometimes to find the right information. And definitely my go to now is Mars Pharmacy. I found Mars online during COVID, actually, and started to follow along, started to follow the owner, Una, and all the unreal advice she was given for everyday issues that we all experience, educating us on on things that are going on in everyday life, but we just don't know the facts and how to treat those things and how to, you know, what we should be doing and just unbelievable education, really. And that was started my relationship with Mars way back a few years ago. And we're absolutely delighted that they're now the partner for the Dig podcast. And you're going to hear a little bit more about them today. Our hormone health is a key element of our overall health and well-being, And our team at Mars are here to support you on this journey. You may be supporting a child through puberty, planning to start a family, or beginning your menopause journey. But no matter what stage of life you're at, it's important to arm yourself with the knowledge and information relating to your hormone health. Our expert team are on hand to advise and support you in relation to your wellness queries. Visit mars.ie or contact us on our social media for more information and guidance. And don't forget that we also ship to Northern Ireland and you can enjoy 15% off all full price items on mars.ie with the code DIG15. All orders are packed with care by our warehouse team enjoying free delivery over €45. Thank you so much for that, Una. And now back to our guest on the DIG podcast. Okay, so when I'm listening to you, I I think what was on my side for my big career change was youth and no responsibilities. So I wasn't married, no mortgage, living at home. Yep. And if it didn't work, I'd just go back to occupational therapy. Yeah. Now I have a lot more. So it's just like you've said. And I think the big thing that scares people is money, right? Let's face it. Absolutely. So what you said there's good is you have a lot of work to do before you do make the big decision. Absolutely. And it's okay to be listening to podcasts and thinking about it and asking people and all before yeah. you take the leap. It's important you do that, right? Oh, 100%. Yes. 100%. Part of it. And too. like you need to kind of think about it as like think big but act small. So what I mean by that is like, you know, you take, you've, you break your steps up. So you look at the end picture to where you think you might want to go. And then you begin to kind of problem solve and risk freely evaluate what does that look like? Can I talk to people in the industry? Is there a way that, you know, around the qualification, as in, can I do it part time? Is there a risk free way to learn a little bit? Can I do a micro learning module, which is like this mini piece of learning that will have a credit within maybe five credits, um, that helps me to understand what this profession is like. I mean, yeah, actually, I'm really engaged in that. Now I want to talk to somebody who actually does this job. Now don't just talk to one person because that person might love their job, they might hate their job, they might not really care. So, you know, begin to talk to a few people that are doing that particular role and see what the opportunities are like. See if you can take, you know, maybe a four-day week or reduce your week in some way so that you can begin to get risk-free access before you make decisions. Because making very big decisions very quick often leads to rationalisation and that's a problem. So think about your tasks as being the big task, the macro task, and then reverse engineer and go, okay, so this is the big thing. Then I'm going to take a maxi task. Then I'm going to do a mini task and then I'm going to micro task and look at, well, what does that look like? So what's the micro task? What can I do in the next three months? What can I do in the next six months? What can I do in the next 12 months and what can I do in the next 18 months? So then you have this kind of pattern to what you're doing, how you're doing it, why you're doing it. Okay, so this is a, this is a piece of work here that we're talking on Absolutely. for our career change. Yeah. Um, and I suppose it's the uns- when people don't do that work and then they fall into their new position and then they're like, oh, have I done the right yeah. thing? And then it's panic, anxiety, stress, yeah. all of that. Yeah. But this is about career change, not yeah. job change. Yeah. So job change oh, right. is very different. So if you want to change job in the same industry or you want to move to a different industry, but you want to retain the function of what you're doing, which is, you know, you're going to stay as a marketing director or you're going to stay as 
an occupational therapist or whatever it is that you're doing, but you want to change industry or change job, that's a whole different ballgame. Yes. This is talking about career changes totally. where you're going from teacher to engineer or, you know, something as absolute as that. So job change is totally different. That's where you're going and you're asking yourself, well, what industry do I want to work in? What does the next job look like for me? So that's different and that can happen quite quickly. But the career piece has to be thought out and considered. Anything else within that that uh, people should be thinking about if it's career change, what do they need to be working on or any other problems you see creeping up for people that are embracing this career change in their life? Yeah, so I think we've hit on a lot of them. But the one other part of that I would build in is getting to know yourself. There is no assessment. There is nothing that anybody can do that helps you to know yourself better. So whatever that, like I talk to people about Tactical Thursday. So it's taking this pause every Thursday morning with your first coffee or your first, whatever it is that you like to drink first thing in the morning. And um, notebook and pen in hand. I always say get a notebook that makes you smile when you look at it. So it's not the one from work. You know, and maybe that would make you smile, but just a notebook that you enjoy writing with a pen that you like to write and answer five questions. What went well? Where was the struggle? What was I in control of? What, um, who could I have asked for help? And what's the smallest thing I could do differently next week to improve on this week? So put these pauses for reflection into your week and begin to think, OK, so this is the plan that I'm working on. Have I been realistic in my timeline? Do I need to adjust or readjust something? So really begin to understand what is it that you want to change and why? And the other part of that is think about your career and your job, but ask yourself, what is the function of what I do and what is the environment that I do it in? And they're two very separate things. So I'll often deal with clients that come to me and they say, I want career change. And when we take a deep dive into it, it's actually not the function of their job. They really like what they do, but the environment that they're doing it in is not the right environment for them. So for an example of this is an accountant who was in one of the big business, big companies, um, had done, excelled all of her career and she had decided that this is not for me anymore. But actually what had happened was one of her mentors had left that had been with her through all of her career um, and she was finding the, the kind of the 100% billable hours during this particular season of her life to be a real challenge. So it wasn't accountancy. She didn't need to change her career. She actually needed to look at a role that was in a different type of culture and structure. And that's what she did. And she's now thriving. Um, so it was about the environment that she was doing it in during that particular season of her life. Again, when I go into organisations to work on their entire career strategy, we begin to look at that. And it's brilliant to see organisations talking about this now. They're like, what's our career strategy? How are we helping people to thrive in the roles that they're in but if that's not right for them, how can we retain them? How can we say to them, stay with us, but let's help you move within the organisation so that we retain your knowledge and we help you then to upskill, reskill and retrain to go to a different function. And it's just it's just this magical thing to watch. It's fabulous. I heard, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a company, Fintry. I don't know if you've ever heard of Fintry. Yeah. So they were, it was up in uh, Derry. I was doing some work with um, Ulster University and... <clears throat> They talked about that, that if someone comes to them and said, look, we're not, this isn't the role for me. They said, well, let's, is there an area you'd like yeah. to rotate into? It's like, oh my God, so they can actually just go work anywhere? In yes. Business? They're like, oh, absolutely. They're, yeah. they're part of our team. They have amazing skills. Let's train them up in that area and let's keep our staff. And yeah. it's like, oh my God, is this the way in the world of work now? Yeah. It's amazing. So It's brilliant. Yeah. So you, you see that a lot in companies, obviously, they're starting to think so like this. Very innovative company. Oh, company. So okay. these are companies mm -hmm. that are going and they're not just leading by kind of putting a fancy policy there. And yes, uh, they yeah, live by that. There's they're, no friction between the policy and the practice. And uh, that's something that's really important. Yes. You know, there ha if there's a friction between the policy and the practice, there's an issue. But you have to be able to see your really like well-worded, fabulous policy in practice. And you can see that at every level, people are engaging with this policy. And your job as a business is to remove that friction between the policy and the practice. And once you do that, then magical stuff begins to happen because then you see people going, why would I leave here? I know. You know, I was like, I want to work. When they yeah, were saying it was yeah. making me want to work there. Yeah, yeah so, absolutely. Um, yeah, like I, I, I think hopefully companies and businesses do yeah. start to em embrace that because 
maybe there would be less people yearning for that career change if actually their roles were fulfilling within yeah. the organisation. Yeah, it's fascinating. So uh-huh. there's this thing within the world of work and organisation and career psychology called crafting, job crafting or shaping or fluidity, whatever you want to call it. There's loads of names for it. But ultimately what it is is doing is taking a job and understanding what the person does in it and then saying to them, what bits do you want to kind of not do anymore and what bits do you want to do and then can we craft the role within the needs of the business to help you to do that and is there somebody else that actually wants to do the things that you don't want to do so they have this kind of like almost up for grabs conversation within teams going I'm really not into this is anybody else yeah I'd love that and you're plugging bits so you're crafting the job as an individual but you're also looking at it with the support of an organization and it's fascinating to watch and really interesting it's not going to be 100 percent But the way we're working currently isn't working 100% either. It's like crafting this career strategy. Yeah. That's so exciting. It's so exciting. And there's not many businesses doing it in Ireland at the moment. Mm -hmm. So the ones that I I call them corporate rebels. Mm -hmm. So they're really interested in kind of just moving the goalposts a little bit and going, okay, so let's imagine if we didn't do this and if we did something else and what about this and what about that? And then they run these little pilots and they're agile and they move. But this can happen within big teams, small teams, large organisations, small organisations. It's fascinating to watch. Fascinating. Really brilliant. And this is where then people don't feel afraid to go, I want, I need that curvy career, you know, and it's okay. I'm actually taking this move out sideways because I'm going to upskill, reskill or retrain and then I'm going to come back in and I'm not going to come back in really disadvantaged because I've taken a pause in my career or I've done something different. I'm actually going to come back in with a recognition for the skills. And the, the next part around this, and I think this will resonate a lot perhaps with you, Caroline, I know it does with me. We have to begin to look at unpaid work and paid work in very different ways. So when you're outside of the paid workplace and you are caring for somebody or you're having your family or you're protecting your mental health, there is a skill built in that. There is a skill of like time management. So if you're a busy parent and you're trying to kind of get everybody to where they should be at the times they should be and managing all of that, you can time manage anything. Like you don't need a black belt or a Sigma, whatever they call it. These You have time management skills. You do. End of story. Um, and then if you're advocating on behalf of somebody that has additional needs or as a carer, you are you know your way around the system. You know how to get to people. You know how to communicate on, somebody, on behalf of somebody who needs you to advocate for them. You are a communicator. And we have to begin to recognise, and again, as somebody who's protecting their mental health, if you have, and it's, it's just part of the life that we live, um, if you have taken time out of the paid workplace to protect your mental health and to regain your wellness and your well-being, um, that needs to be recognised as a skill because there is courage in that. You build empathy in it. You understand what it takes to actually step back into wellness. And we need to begin to look at those as employers. And rather than saying, oh, there's a gap in your CV or, you know, what were you doing these years? We need to begin to look at that and go, actually, you know what? We really value those skills. Because if we see on somebody's CV that they played sport at a competitive level, we look at them and go, aren't they great leaders? Let's bring them into the organisation and let's put them in a leadership position. Even though they maybe had not worked in an organisation before, they've come directly from the field of sport or whatever it is, and the doors are open to them because of that. We need to get to the point in our organisations and in our careers where we see the unpaid skills built through parenting, caring and protecting your mental health has been as valuable as those leadership skills that are built on the sports field. Oh my God. So there's people listening. Yeah. So many. (laughs) And I'm an advocate of sport. Love it. But we need to begin to see things in a different way. People who have, like a lot of us, taken time off to have family and or they'll have a sick parent. Yeah. They then feel inadequate when they have to go back into the place of work. This will give them confidence to know And like you said, when you can get them all dropped off everywhere yeah. at the right time, there's yeah. people in the world of work c- couldn't manage that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, How many people do you know in the world of work that miss deadlines? All the time. All the time. We, we never do. Them children are off at the crash and off at the, the yeah. whatever. So so it's about having the confidence to say, well, actually, I was off during these years, but I did. This is what yeah. I was able to do. Absolutely. Did you sit for half example on the Parents Association? Were you the treasurer? Were you the secretary? Were you on the board of management? Um, and if you weren't, you were probably doing other things, you know. So let's, and again, from a, an employer's perspective, let's begin to look at these skills as transferable. They are transferable skills that directly transfer into the paid world of work. 
And then we kind of sit over and we look and we go, okay, these are really reliable, really skilled, highly, highly competent people. And we're saying that we have a skills shortage and we have a talent shortage. We're just looking in the wrong places. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's, it, we need to rethink all of these rules that we have around careers and work because the world of work has changed and we have to change how we think about the world of work and to be far more inclusive, far more. Like one of the areas of employment that went, that there was a, a massive increase in during the pandemic was for people that have additional abilities, different additional needs and people that were neurodiverse. So they could actually work from home. So the rate of employment went up for people in those positions because they didn't have to trans to to travel to work every day. They didn't have to maybe be in an office where all the noises and whatever upset them. And they could do brilliant work in the comfort of their own home. And it was brilliant for organisations. So now it's time to pay back. It is. So this is only a 45 one hour podcast yes. and there's people listening. They're like, right, I'm going to take action you have you can help them so I said Sinead let's tell people because they're going to want to find out how you can help them you have a course so tell us when what's happening with this course yeah thanks um so on the 7th of February uh there's a workshop but it's, it's an online and it's free so I'll give you the link and yes, you put it in the show notes that. yeah and then subsequently to that twice a year I run a master class so it's six months and we go through the whole process of career evolution and how you can do that in a skilled way and then it equips you with the skills to move on. And it's a small group. I facilitate it and it's 10 people. And we give um, a nice discount to your um, listeners if they'd be interested. Dig yeah. 10. So you said dig 10. Get, yeah. Dig 10. Um, if you quote that or when you're yes. reaching out to Sinead. Because you, if you're thinking about changing your career, it's not going to happen overnight. And no. to have the support of someone like you, like we take courses for flipping everything. So why can we not take a course for this? So Absolutely. amazing that you're doing that. And the thing that I, 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 I've talked about education before and I'm a f- I love education. But when you look at the little four-year-old or five-year-old that goes to school, and we talked about homework, but let's talk about the four or five-year-old. And one of the first things you go to, what are you going to be when you grow up? Okay. All right. Okay. Now, fast forward and you have to make a decision when you're 17, 18, 19, that kind of age. How much careers advice do you get in school? Terrible. Like pretty much none. None. So would you imagine if the sole purpose of your education, and it is the sole purpose of your education, is to make a meaningful contribution to society through your job and career. That's what the purpose of education is. Now, we can talk about it from a philosophical perspective. It's about growing minds and all that, and it is. But actually, from an economic perspective, that's why the government educates us. That's it. But imagine saying, you know what? The sole function of your education is to be brilliant at maths. And we tell kids that at four. And then we go, and the best to look with that now. You figure out trigonometry on your own. You figure out hypothesis and Pythagoras and all that crack on your own. And when you get to 17, we're going to make you decide what part of maths you'd like to specialise in. But we're not really going to teach you a whole lot between four and 17. So enjoy now. And do you know what? Someday it'll just dawn on you what you want to do. It'll just, you'll just figure it out. You'll just figure out Pythagoras' theorem. It doesn't work like that. It's the same with careers. We need to begin to educate people how to manage their careers, how to evolve in them. And, and then we begin to have different conversations um, and people don't have this awful feeling going to work because they know this is how work works. This is how careers work. This is how I manage it. It's OK to change. It's OK to do different things. I know life's too short to have yeah. that feeling in your stomach that you're not in the right job oh. or not in the right career. Yeah. So try to take action. And maybe this is a sign you need if you're listening. Possibly. So the theme of the series eight, Sinead, is called It's All About Thriving in Business and Life. Yes. So we can't separate no. One from the other, definitely not. And we've teamed up with Mars Pharmacy. So, you yes. know, Ina, she's some amazing. Woman. Um, so we, we want to focus on looking after ourselves a bit better. So you're very busy. You're a mummy. You have four kids. You're building a house. You've got a really busy career and you're all over the place and uh, doing last minute drop offs to podcasts that you weren't expected to do, which I really appreciate. But how do you look after yourself? What do you do? What do you do? What's your main thing you do to make sure you're the best you can be or as good as you can be in life? So it's really hard. I'm not going to lie. Um, there are days that like I don't look like this most mornings. Like, I, <laughs> You know, so I I have a couple of non-negotiables and they are the gym for me is really important. So I do the gym three times a week. That's just something that I need. And I've worked really hard to carve that time out. I've always had an active lifestyle and I lost that for the first week, four kids. So our first two kids, 
I just lost the gym entirely. But I had to work really hard to get that back and to to find that time. Um, And the other thing that I do is I book all of my appointments for my hair, for my eyebrows, all of that kind of maintenance stuff in January. So I go to my hairdresser and I book in for the first Tuesday, every two months, the first Tuesday for coat and colour. Um, and I get my eyebrows done. I've that all booked in. So I know that they're coming up and I have that and it's a non-negotiable. Because, and I can cancel it if I need to, but I try not to. And I've preserved, so I lived in Dublin for years and I have the same hairdresser in Dublin and I live in Cavan. So I come to her and I keep it. So it's a full day for me and it's every two months. And so they're the small things that I do. Um, and yeah, so and I'm hitting that age now where... I'm 44, so I'm beginning to think about bloods and perimenopause and all that kind of stuff. So I, I do my bloods every six months, get a breast check, um, cervical, cervical pap smears and all that kind of crack. The stuff that we don't like talking about, but have to be done. So that's what I do. But it is about planning it and then being a little bit strategic in terms of making choices. And a full day in Dublin every two months. I yeah. love it. We love it as well. <laughs> does yeah. your husband love that? Or I mean, like, well, does, he just, do you, does he keep the kids and you just shimmy on there for a full day? Yeah, well, yeah. So we had it that, like, That's you know, amazing. We, we really, and I suppose from the very start, we've had very, you know, so we're both very involved with the kids. Our careers are now interdependent. So my career depends on his and his career depends on me. So we have to kind of sit. So as a couple, we do Tactical Thursday on Thursday nights. So, tonight um, there is no TV and we sit down he'll usually have a beer I'll have a glass of wine and we go okay so what's coming up next week what do you need to be around for what do I need to be around for and then we'll call in grandparents or whoever we need to give a little bit of extra help if we need it if not we'll try to manage it ourselves and then we'll also kind of go so if there's something we can do together we'll manage like the travel together but also he works out of away from the home on his travel days are Monday and Wednesday and mine are Tuesday and Thursday. So if there's a sick child or there's a call from the school or the crash, I automatically pick it up on Monday or Wednesday. And if it, it always comes to me, the call. But then I will ring Alan and say, look, you're at home Tuesday and Thursday. It's your day to pick up and to come home and stay home if you need to. So we don't have to think about if there's a sick child or anything like that. We have a pattern that's in place. And it just means that we pick up and drop off on different days and we call in where we need to. But we, we try to organise on the Thursday beforehand. But that's not easy. And sometimes, like, he's drinking his beer and I'm drinking my wine and there's not a lot been said. <laughs> <because> <laughs> we're trying to fit, or maybe one of us has said something that the other doesn't agree with. And they're not always really, like, we're not sitting there and, like, candles and whatever. Else. Yeah. We're actually trying to work out how do we both have a full-on career and life while we're both parenting four children. And it's not easy. But um, it, but that's how you make it work in the best way you to. can. Yeah, you know? we have to. Well, there is a big piece of advice at the flipping end of the podcast. Like I'm going on. Because I would have a habit of saying, Jared, what are you doing tomorrow? And I'm nearly afraid to say because I need him. And yeah. then he's like, oh, whatever this. So that's what we need to be doing. Yeah. And it means that if that call comes from school or crash, somebody needs to be picked up or somebody's sick. You know then... Like I know on Monday or Wednesday, if they're sick, I have my office days. Need to, like I get up early in the morning and I'll do my office day before they wake and I'll work late that night. But during the day then I'm with whoever needs me and it's the same on Wednesday. But if that happens on Tuesday or Thursday, we don't have to talk about it. Alan knows he's doing it. So, so you're a psychologist. I can see where this is coming from. What does he do? So he does the same. So okay, okay. So, so no, no, he's not. He's a quantity surveyor. Oh right, yeah. Oh right. No, no. So I he's in construction. Okay, he's totally different. But you, but obviously, you've helped him understand the process of that because I'm sure because that sounds very like your work. As in, you. But that's brilliant that you do that. I'm going to try to talk to Jordan about this. <laughs> He'd be like, "Who are you talking to on that flipping podcast? <laughs> what do we have to do?" But like Ryan, are you listening to this in the background? Loney and being out productions, you're all about multitasking and finding the right way for you and Kathy and all. And um, so that's a, um, that's brilliant. It has to be that way. Brilliant. And I've now, I no longer, like when I'm gone, I used to be leaving the food and all that kind of stuff behind me. So I've stopped that completely. So on the days that I'm out of, so my office is at home and on the, the Tuesday or the Thursday, I'm not doing Tuesday and Thursdays cooking before I leave. I'm just not anymore. And that has taken a while to manage and that has taken a while to figure out. 
And there's a bit of a joke in our house, like with the kids, they're like, oh, daddy's making lunches today. They're not going to be great. But they just have to learn that they're not going to be the same as mine. They're not going to be the same. And that's actually okay. And it's a good learning for them as well. when you get loads of bars of chocolate in your lunch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's terrible. I don't mean that, but so, you know, it's but different. Yeah, it's different. Mm-hmm. So, um, and, and dinner is whatever is in he the makes. Cupboard. Yeah. That's it. And, you know, he's equally equipped to do all of those things as I am. Equally equipped. Amazing. So, but it's really hard to have those conversations. And there's an awful lot of judgment around them. A lot of Huge things. amount of judgment. Yeah. And the kids will go to him when they're crying. Or, and, and I would have very often people would say to me, oh God, they normally look for their mummy when they're sick or when they're crying and they don't always look for you. And that's so hard because they don't. But it's a reflection of our parenting style and we have to keep coming back to that. Yeah, well, I, I told you I'm living with, and then we're going to go because I mean, yeah. you have to go with, I'm living with my parents at the minute and um, my mum's teaching me how you really look after men, right? So yeah. you hate their plate first and mm. am I feeding Gerald enough and all this here? And I think, well, we don't work. I know it's the older traditional yeah, way and absolutely. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but I guess we're conditioned to be the provider, make sure the meals are ready before we leave. Yeah. Make sure all of that's set up. Not everybody, but that's the way yeah. we were brought up. Same as that, yeah. So yeah. Um, I've said, Mummy, I don't sit around and wonder if Jared's hydrated. Like she said, I wonder if he got enough milk there was dinner. And like, I don't, I shall not mind me saying, because I do that, we do laugh and talk about this, but I guess we're conditioned, like you talk yeah. about, to be that. But actually, in this new, busy, modern world yeah. we're in, it doesn't work. It just we have to change. It doesn't fit it doesn't anymore. Work. That's um, another, right? Well, that's series okay. nine, right? Okay, great. Series nine, okay. <laughs> so definitely coming back to talk about that in series nine. Thank you for being You're on the so day. You're so welcome, Caroline. Oh my God, no, I'm, I'm so grateful for you being here. And thank you. Thank you for sharing the knowledge and like imagine the people that could possibly make a career change because yeah. of what you've just said. So well, like unbelievable impact that you made yeah. in with your work. Thanks so, for Thank Caroline. you so much. Thank you to everybody for listening to the like podcast. I know I veered off a wee bit on the end, but it's life. So we're also, we're, we're here, we're being professional and having a podcast, but we're thinking, oh, what's for dinner? <laughs> He's loving the children, blah, blah. But Sinead has that bit figured out in, in some respect. And I guess we all just need to work and find our ways to juggle and make sure that we're all happy and thriving in business and in life. So thank you for being on the our uh, thank you for listening to the Dig Podcast. If you are watching on YouTube, if you could hit subscribe and if you're listening on Apple and Spotify, hit follow because then we're able to reach out to more people. We're able to get people like Sinead on that can actually change your life and we can't do that unless the podcast grows. So thank you for listening and um, to another week of the Dig Podcast. <laughs>